Hello, I'm Crystal Parikh. I'm the director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at New York University, and I have the tremendous privilege of welcoming you and the APA Institute's artist in residence, Ocean Wong, to the start of an exciting year of programming. Before, um, I, before I begin, I would like to take a moment to have us acknowledge that we are gathered on the land, unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We would also like to recognize that New York City is currently home to approximately 100,000 people who identify as indigenous, including many peoples from the Pacific. We at the Institute affirm our commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I also want to take a moment to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Institute staff for all of their work and commitment, without which tonight's event would not be, um, have been possible. This event launches our year-long focus on the wake of war, um, in which we ask how war has served as a driving force in producing the migrations, diasporas, and encounters that comprise Asian, American, Asian Pacific American experience. As your program indicates, um, I will first be introducing um, Ocean Fong, um, from whom we'll hear a few words um, about our event tonight. And then um, I will return to introduce um, our other guest for the evening, who will be reading and sharing in conversation with him. After our event, there will be an opportunity to purchase books from the NYU Bookstore and a book signing. Um, in the book that we um, celebrate tonight, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, Ocean Vuong writes, let no one mistake us for the fruit of violence, but that violence, having passed through the fruit, failed to spoil it. Like our artists in residence, we at the Institute hope to un understand how war shapes our community, but is not the sum of our, ex uh, our experience or our existence. Vuong also writes, I'm not telling you a story so much as a shipwreck, the pieces floating, finally legible. Likewise, we hope to understand what follows in its wake very much in the sense, um, the wake of war that is, um, very much in the sense of the resurfaced wreck where the wake registers both the disturbances and the vigilance that war affects. Focus not only on the conditions and experiences, um, excuse me, uh, focus not only on the conditions and experiences of war, um, but how um, that past reverberates across decades, Ocean Vuong thoughtfully addresses an array of concerns that scholars, activists, and students have made central to Asian Pacific American studies and politics. As a poet, essayist, and novelist, he writes with elegance, care, and precision about migrants and refugees, families, love, desire, violence, and resilience. Vuong has described survival as a form of active self-knowledge and a creative force, and his work has inspired and brought insight to a generation of Asian Pacific Americans, including many I know who are in this room. And in the coming year, Vuong will continue his work on the Center for Refugee Poetics, which is, in his words, a nomadic epicenter of discourse that takes seriously and centrally the work of artists who, due to war, violence, state persecution, and rights violation, human rights violations, have been forcibly displaced. To stay updated on Ocean's programs and other APA Institute activities, please follow us on social media at APA Institute on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and consider signing up to receive our newsletter, which guests can do on our website, um, apa.nyu.edu, or at the registration table. Um, and now a word on Ocean Vuong's many accomplishments. He is the author of the novel on Earth, where, um, on the recently published novel um, on Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous, um, published by Penguin Press, which was recently longlisted for the National Book Award for Fiction and is forthcoming in 16 languages worldwide. His critical, critically acclaimed poetry, Night Sky with Exit Wounds, um, published in 2016 by Copper Canyon Press, was a New York Times top 10 book of 2016 and winner of the T.S. Eliot Prize, Whiting Award. Award, Tom Gunn Award, and Ford Prize for the Best First Collection. A Ruth Lilly Fellow from the Poetry Foundation, and his other, um, honor, he's, he is a Ruth Fel uh, Lilly Fellow from the Poetry Foundation, and his other honors include fellowships from the Lannan Fe uh, Foundation, the Civitella Ranieri Foundation, Elizabeth George Foundation, Academy of American Poets, and Pushcart Prize. Wong's writings have been featured in The Atlantic, Harper's, um, The Nation, New Public, uh, New Republic, excuse me, um, The New Yorker, The New York Times, and American Poetry Review, which awarded him the Stanley Kunitz Prize for Younger Poets. Born in Saigon, Vietnam, Vuong lives in Northampton, Massachusetts, where he is an assistant professor in the um, MFA program for poets and writers at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. We had the happy news last week that he was named a 2019 MacArthur Fellow, AKA Genius, um, and, um, and we're so proud to have him. And of course, most importantly to us, he is a 2019-2020 artist in residence at the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. Please join me in welcoming Ocean Vuong.
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here. Can you hear me okay? It's a good volume. Um, I, I'd just like to say a few words to introduce tonight's uh, events and, and to say thank you um, to the APA Center at NYU for entrusting me in, in working with me in uh, celebrating uh, these writers and to celebrate my tenure as artist in residence throughout the year. Um, and thank you also uh, for your presence in being here and for your attention uh, in a world that is uh, ever scarce um, in attention, in, in uh, the, the, the capacity to hold uh, our presence. Um, it means a lot for you to, to be here, not only for myself, but to these other brilliant writers. Um, I started my career uh, in the city. I came here to study business at Pace University. I quickly dropped out um, <laughs> after, after three weeks. Um, and uh, I was too ashamed. It's typical Asian American, first, uh, first to go to college, too ashamed to go back to my family empty-handed. So I wandered the city trying to quote unquote find my voice. And uh, I entered uh, open mics, you know, uh, sign your name on a list. You get three minutes to prove to a room full of 20, 30 people in a bar about that you care about something. Um, and it taught me how to, to, to write the first sentence and to write it so that it matters, so that to get the, the person drinking the gin and tonic and turn around. <laughs> You know, if you get somebody to turn around from a bar, then you, you're on your way. Um, so that was my master class, uh, in a way. And it happened right, uh, right around the corner here, bar 13, near, near Union Square. And um, that, the tradition that I learned there from the, the open mics and, and the slams is that nobody celebrates themselves alone. And so when uh, the folks at APA asked me to, to hold an event to to crown uh, this, my tenure here, I wanted to do it the way I learned it back in the Bar 13 in those community spaces that rescued me and gave me a, a position to speak. And the way we do it there is that everybody comes up together. We, 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 we have folks who share the microphone and we, we can showcase the praxis of a creative life that it's never one person in the spotlight, even if they get an award, even if the, the, the scarcity of capitalism allows only one person to stand in one place briefly. It is actually a, a huge community that brought them there. And I wanted to have these writers uh, showcase here tonight, Mahogany Brown, Sinan Antun, Alexander Chi, Monica Sok. Uh, these writers mean the world to me. I've been reading them. My work is possible because of them, and I could never celebrate myself without being able to showcase their voices together. Uh, I would be nothing without their presence. And um, thank you so much to APA for uh, letting me uh, celebrate uh, this space and uh, to celebrate my tenure here in the way that is most meaningful to me and most meaningful to the community that made me. Um, so without further ado, uh, we'll, we'll introduce them and get the show on the road. Thank you so much. So as Ocean has already told you, um, we are so fortunate to have um, a whole slate of incredibly talented and accomplished writers. Um, I'm going to be um, introducing them, but I should just say that these biographies are much shorter than they ought to be just for the sake of time because they are incredibly accomplished. <laughs> um, so first we will have Sinan Antun, who is a poet, novelist, translator, and scholar. Born and raised in Baghdad, he left to the, uh, he left to the United States after, 1990, after the 1991 Gulf War and obtained a doctorate in Arabic literature from Harvard University. University. He has published three collections of poetry in Arabic and four novels that have been translated into several languages. His third novel, The Corpse Washer, published by Yale University Press in 2013, was long listed for the Inde um, Independent International Fiction Prize in 2014, won the Best Arab American Book Award in 2014, and was shortlisted by the 2000 th for the 2013 Arabic Booker. 
Um, second, we have Monica Suk, who is a com uh, com Cambodian American poet and the daughter of former refugees. She is the author of the forthcoming A Nail in the, in the Evening um, Hangs On, forth um, which is forthcoming in 2020 by Copper Canyon Press. Along with many other honors, her work has been recognized with the Discovery Prize from the 92nd Street Y, and currently Sok is a 2018-2020 um, Segner Fellow at Stanford University and teaches poetry at Bante Sri um, and the, the Center for Empowering Refugees and Immigrants in Oakland. She is originally from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Alexander Chi is the author of the novels Edinburgh, um, published in 2001 by Picador, and The Queen of the Night, um, published in 2016 by Mariner Books, and the essay collection How to Write an Autobiographical Novel um, by uh, Hupton Mifflin um, Harcourt, uh, Harcourt excuse me, in 2018. He is a contributing writer, um, editor at the New Republic, um, and an editor at large at the Virginia Quarterly Review. His essays and stories have appeared in the New York Times. Times Magazine, Best American Essays 2016 and 2019, T Magazine, Harper's, and the Yale Review, among others. He's an associate professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth College. And last but not least, uh, Mahogany L. Brown is a writer, organizer, and educator. She is the artistic director of Urban World NYC and poetry coordinator at St. Francis College, Brooklyn, and the recipient of numerous fellowships. She is the author of Woke, A Young Poet's Call to Justice in 2020. Um, Woke Baby, published in 2018, and Black Girl Magic, published um, in 2018 by Macmillan Publishers, as well as Kissing Caskets, um, published in 2017 by Yes Yes Books, and Dear Twitter, um, published in 2010 by Penman, uh, Penmanship Books. As an artist for Justice grantee, she is completing her first book of essays on mass incarceration, investigating its effects on women and children, and Brown resides in Brooklyn, New York. And of course, welcome back to the stage, Ocean Vuong. Okay, hello everyone again. Uh, I'll read really quickly and then um, we'll move we'll move through and then we'll have a, a discussion. This scene uh, occurs um, as a brief bike ride in Hartford, Connecticut, between these two boys. We rode along the Connecticut River as night broke into itself, the moon freshly high above the oaks, its edges hazed by an unseasonably warm autumn. The current churned with white froth to our right, once in a while, after two or three weeks without rain, a body would float up from its depths, a bleached flash of a shoulder tapping the surface, and the families cooking out along the banks would stop, and a hush would come down along the children, and then someone would shout, Oh God, oh God, and someone else would call 911. And sometimes it's a false alarm. A refrigerator rusted and lichen stained to the shade of a brown face. And sometimes it's the fish gone belly up in the thousands for no reason. The river face iridescent overnight. I saw all the blocks in our city you were too busy at work to know about, Ma. Blocks where things happened. Things even Trevor, having lived all his life on this side of the river, the white side, the one I was now riding on, never saw. I saw the lights on Asylum Avenue, where there used to be an asylum that was actually a school for the deaf, that caught fire and killed half a ward back in 18-something, and to this day no one knows what caused it. But I know it as the street where my friend Sid lived with his family after they came over from India in 95. How his mom, a school teacher back in New Delhi, went door to door, hobbling on her bloated diabetic feet, selling hunting knives for Cutco to make $97 a week cash. There were the Canino brothers, whose father was in jail for what seemed like two lifetimes for going 70 on a 65 in front of a state trooper on 91. That and the 20 bags of heroin and the Glock under his passenger seat, still, still. There was Marin, 
who took the bus 45 minutes each way to work at the Sears in Farmington, who always had gold around her neck and ears, whose high heels clacked like the slowest, most deliberate applause when she walked to the corner store for cigarettes and hot Cheetos, her Adam's apple jutting out, a middle finger to the men who called her faggot, called her homo who'd say, holding their daughter's or son's hand, I'm gonna kill you, bitch, I'm gonna cut you AIDS, gonna take you out, don't sleep tonight, don't sleep tonight, don't sleep. We passed the tenement building on New Britain Avenue, where we lived for three years, where I rode my pink bike with training wheels up and down the linoleum halls so the kids on the block wouldn't beat me up for loving a pink thing. I must have ridden down those halls a hundred times a day, the little bell clinking as I hit the wall at each end, how Mr. Carlton, the man who lived in the last apartment, kept coming out and yelling, Who are you? What are you doing here? Why don't you do that outside? Who are you? You're not my daughter. You're not destiny. But all that, the whole building is gone now, replaced by a YMCA, even the tenement parking lot where nobody parked since no one had cars, busted through with weeds nearly four feet high, is gone. All of it bulldozed and turned into a community garden with scarecrows made from mannequins thrown out by the dollar store off Bushnell. Entire families are swimming and playing handball where we used to sleep. People are doing butterfly strokes where Mr. Carlton eventually died alone in his bed, how no one knew for weeks until the whole floor started to reek and the SWAT team, I don't know why, had to come bust down the door with guns, how for a whole month Mr. Carlton's things were left out in a big iron dumpster out back and a wooden hand-painted pony, its, told, its tongue lolled face peeking out of the dumpster's top in the rain. Trevor and I kept riding, past Church Street where Big Joe's sister OD'd, then the parking lot behind the Mega Mega XX Depot where Sasha OD'd. The park where Jake and B-Rab OD'd, except B-Rab lived only to be caught years later stealing laptops from Trinity College and got four years in county, no parole, which was heavy, especially for a white kid from the suburbs. There was Nacho who lost his right leg in the Gulf War, and whom you could find on weekends sliding under Jack Ray's cars with a skateboard at the Maybell Auto Repair where he worked, where he once pulled a beautiful, screaming, red-faced baby from the trunk of a Nissan left in the back of the shop during a blizzard, how he let his crutches fall and cradled the baby with both hands and the air held him for the first time in years as the snow came down then rose back up from the ground so bright that for a blurred merciful hour everyone in the city forgot why they were trying to get out of it there's mazzucatos on franklin where i had my first cannoli where nothing I knew ever died, where I sat looking out the window one summer night from the fifth floor of our building, and the air was warm and sweet like it is now, and there were the low voices of young couples, their converses and Air Force Ones tapping against each other on the fire escapes as they worked to make the body speak its other tongues, the sound of matches or flames sparked from lighters, the shape and shine of nine millimeters or Colt 45s, which was how we turn death into a joke here, how we reduce fire to the size of cartoon raindrops, then suck them through cigarello tips like myths, because eventually the river rises here. It overflows to claim it all and to show us what we lost like it always had. The bike spokes whirred, the smell of sewage from the water plant stung my eyes just before the wind did with it what it does with the names of the dead, swept it all behind me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this next section is, is where the novel starts to disintegrate into poetry. It was important for me um, as a writer to have the cohesion of a novel fall apart um, in the middle and then reclaim itself. And the big question I ask is, what happens when the novel stops noveling? <laughs> 
How does it continue? What happens when the reason why you are here is taken away from you? How do you formally innovate forward to complete the project of a novel when the novel as a privilege is no longer available? That was a question that was important. And in the middle of this book, it breaks away, and, and you'll see why. This section starts to navigate uh, masculinity, particularly the toxic forms, and that it is even poisonous to those who wield it. Trevor rusted pickup and no license. Trevor 16 blue jeans streaked with deer blood. Trevor too fast and not enough. Trevor waving his John Deere cap from the driveway as you ride by on your squeaky Schwinn. Trevor who fingered a freshman girl then tossed her underwear in the lake for fun, for summer. For your hands were wet and Trevor's a name like an engine starting up in the night who snuck out to meet a boy like you, yellow and barely there, Trevor going fifty through his daddy's wheat field, who jams all his fries into a whopper and chews with both feet on the gas, your eyes closed, riding shotgun, the wheat a yellow confetti, three freckles on his nose, three periods to a boy's sentence. Trevor Burger King over McDonald's cause the smell of smoke on the beef makes it real. Trevor Bucktooth clicking on his inhaler as he sucked eyes shut. Trevor who says, I like sunflowers best, they go so high. Trevor with a scar like a comma on his neck, syntax of what next, what next, what next. Imagine going so high, he says, and still opening that big. Trevor loading the shotgun, two red shells at a time. It's kind of like being brave, he says, like you got this big old head full of seeds and no arms to defend yourself. His hard, lean arms aimed in the rain. He touches the trigger's black tongue, and you swear you taste his finger in your mouth as it pulls. Trevor pointing at the one-winged sparrow thrashing in black dirt and takes it for something new. Something smoldering like a word, like a Trevor who knocked on your window at three in the morning, who you thought was smiling until you saw the blade held over his mouth. I made this, I made this for you, he said, the knife suddenly in your hand. Trevor, later on your steps in the gray dawn, his face in his arms. I don't wanna, he said, his panting, his shaking hair, the blur of it. Please tell me I am not, he said, through the sound of his knuckles as he popped them like the word but, 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 and you take a step back. Please tell me I am not, he said. I am not a faggot, am I? Am I? Are you? Trevor the hunter, Trevor the carnivore, the redneck, not a pansy, shotgunner, sharpshooter, not fruit or fairy, Trevor meat eater, but never veal. Fuck that, never again, he says, after his daddy told him the story when he was seven at the table, veal roasted with rosemary, how they were made, how the difference between veal and beef is the children. The veal are the children of cows or calves. They are locked in boxes the size of themselves, a body box like a coffin, but alive like a home. The children, the veal, they stand very still because tenderness depends on how little the world touches you. To stay tender, the weight of your life cannot lean on your bones. We love eating what's soft, his father said, looking dead into Trevor's eyes. Trevor, who would never eat a child. Trevor, the child with a scar on his neck like a comma, a comma you now put your mouth to, that violet hook holding two complete thoughts, two complete bodies without subjects, only verbs. When you say Trevor, you mean the action, the pine stuck thumb on the big lighter, the sound of his boots on the Chevy's sun-bleached hood. Your Trevor, your brunette but blonde dusted arms man pulling you into the truck. When you say Trevor, you mean you are the hunted, a hurt he can't refuse because that's something, baby, that's real. And you want it to be real, to be swallowed by what drowns you, only to surface brimming at the mouth, which is kissing, which is nothing if you forget. 
His tongue in your throat, Trevor speaks for you. He speaks and you darken, a flashlight going out in his hands, so he knocks you in the head to keep the bright on. He turns you this way and that to find his path through the dark woods, the dark words which have limits like bodies, like the calf waiting in its coffin house. No window, but a slot for oxygen, pink nose pressed to the autumn night, inhaling the bleached stench of cut grass, the tar and gravel road, coarse sweetness of leaves in a bonfire, the minutes, the distance, the earthly manure of his mother, a field away, clover, sassafras, Douglas fir, Scottish myrtle, the boy, the motor oil, the body, it fills up, and your thirst overflows what holds it, and your ruin, you thought it would nourish him, that he would feast on it and grow into a beast you could hide in, but every box will be opened in time, in language, the line broken like Trevor, who stared too long into your face, saying, at last, where am I? Where am I? Because by then there was blood in your mouth. By then the truck was totaled into a dusked oak smoke from the wrinkled hood. Trevor, vodka breathed and skull thin, said, it feels good, said, don't go nowhere. As the sun slid into the trees, don't this feel good? As the windows reddened like someone seeing through shut eyes. Trevor, who texted you after two months of silence, writing, please, instead of PLZ. Trevor, who was running from home, his crazy old man, who was getting the fuck out, soaked Levi's, who ran away to the park because where else when you're 16, who you found in the rain under the metal slide shaped like a hippopotamus, whose icy boots you took off and covered one by one each dirt cold toe with your mouth the way your mother used to do when you were small and shivering because he was shivering, your Trevor, your all-American beef but no view, your John Deere, jade vein in his jaw stilled lightning you trace with your teeth because he tasted like the river and Maybe you were always one wing away from sinking because the calf waits in its cage so calmly to be view. Because you remembered, and memory is a second chance. Both of you lying side by side, two commas with no words at last to keep you apart. You who crawled from the wreck of summer like sons leaving their mother's bodies. A calf in a box waiting, a box tighter than a womb, the rain coming down, its hammers on the metal like an engine revving up, the night standing in violet air, a calf shuffling inside, hoofs soft as erasers, the bell on its neck ringing and ringing, the shadow of a man growing up to it, the man with his keys, the commas of doors, your head on Trevor's chest, the calf being led by a string, how it stops to inhale, nose pulsing with dizzying sassafras, Trevor asleep beside you, steady breaths, rain, warmth welling through his plaid shirt like steam issuing from the calf's flanks as you listen to the bell across the star-flooded field, the sound shining like a knife, the sound buried deep in Trevor's chest, and you listen, that ringing, you listen like an animal learning how to speak. So I'm really honored to be here. Thank you to the APA and um, wonderful to welcome and celebrate Ocean. So I have the fortune of being here with you and the misfortune of having to follow that really <laughs> fantastic reading. I will read from my last novel, The Book of Collateral Damage, which was written originally in Arabic and translated by Jonathan Wright. And I'll say a few things about the setting of the novel. In 2003, a few months after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, an Iraqi-American 
academic goes back to his hometown of Baghdad with a documentary uh, crew and um, as a translator. And there he meets in one of Baghdad's famous streets, Al Mutanabi Street, where um, old books are sold. A strange bookseller who has this who has this project, impossible project, of writing the history of the war, minute by minute, but from the perspective of uh, objects, flora, fauna, uh, and so on. And he comes back, and the, the bookseller entrusts him with parts of these, this manuscript, and he comes back to New York. So there are two narrators, one an Iraqi living in New York from the country that is waging a war, destroying his home country, and then the bookseller who is in Baghdad living the war. And um, I will read uh, one of the dimensions in the novel is these fragments from his manuscript where objects narrate the moment of their death or their life until they die. So this one is called The Colloquy of Kashan. And you'll know what Kashan is, hopefully, by the time I finish. The vast majority of Kashans are born in the city of Kashan, of course. But the Kashan I am talking about here is a Baghdad Kashan in body and spirit. She was born in the women's prison in Baghdad in the late 1940s. Her birth wasn't difficult, but it was slow. For months, her mother knelt in front of her every morning with the patience of someone who has taken a vow of endless prayer. With tired hands, she gradually coaxed her into this world. She didn't have a midwife to help her, nor a nurse or a doctor. For months, she stopped only for a short rest at noon, when she would go off to have a simple meal and then come back and work on the body of her daughter until the guard told her to stop a little after sunset. Then she would touch the face of her daughter affectionately as if she were saying good night before she and the other women working in the room went back to their cells. Some of the mothers would sing softly or quarrel with one another when the guard wasn't around. But this mother worked in stony silence most of the time. A smile rarely found its way to her face. In the first few weeks, Kashan was very small and couldn't see or understand anything. She couldn't make out the features of her mother's face until the features of her own face emerged. Her features were no different from those of thousands of Kashans because they were all heirs to a limited number of designs with variations that had been in circulation since the 16th century. Her mother's mouth was as small as a cherry. Her eyes were deep blue under bushy eyebrows. Her complexion was the color of wheat and her black hair was hidden under a turquoise headscarf that framed her sad face. On her right cheek, a knife had left a deep scar, the same knife that she had picked up off the ground after the attack and planted it in the chest of the man who had tormented her for years. That silenced him forever, but she paid a high price for her silence and she wasn't free for long, less than four hours. The old Iranian foreman, who along with his colleagues had been brought from Iran to supervise the training of the women, and who had himself chosen her after giving her a test, would wander around every day, inspecting the progress of the work, stand in front of each kashan and watch or make observations. She was delighted when he praised her several times, muttering in Persian, bah, bah. After a few months, Kashan had grown in stature until she was almost the height of her mother, who no longer sat cross-legged or bent over, but sat on a chair. Pride began to fill her heart when she saw the intricate patterns and the fringes of her firstborn Kashan coming toward completion and the colored lines converging. The lines met diverged and skirted the geometrical shapes arranged regularly within the rectangular frame. When the last knot of Kashan was in place, her mother stood up, amazed at what her hands had made. She ran her hands over the surface of the carpet, kissed it at several spots and smelt it, smelled it as her mother had smelled her when she kissed her because she knew that she would never see her again. 
The next day, two men folded it up, tied it in several places with cord, picked it up and put it in a storeroom in the prison until other ones were ready. They stuck a pin in it to hold it in place, a piece of paper with Kashan, January 1949, written on it. The next day, the mother started work on another Kashan that she would also have to abandon as soon as it was finished. The new Kashan lay slumped in the darkness of the storeroom for a month while they put others like it nearby. When there were 10 of them, men loaded them into a van that took them to a carpet store in the Daniel market. It spent two months there until it won the admiration of a woman who, along with her husband, was looking for something to decorate their new home. The merchant lied about Kashan's provenance. He didn't say it was born in Baghdad, but insisted that it was imported from Iran. The woman added two other ones, and our Kashan ended up in the reception room, where it stayed for many years without moving except at the start of every summer, when the carpet beaters come and picked it up with other ones to beat the dust out of them. Then they rolled them up, tied them up with pieces of cloth to put them behind the furniture or in another room to wait for the weather to turn cold again. But the first time the carpet beaters came, it was frightened and thought they were getting rid of it and it would languish in darkness for eternity. But it got used to this in subsequent years and began to enjoy its long slumber. It slept and dreamed of the sheep that had given it their fleeces. It saw the sheep grazing on distant foothills, corralled by a shepherd under a balmy sky and a sun blocked from time to time by clouds driven gently by the wind. Kashan also dreamed of its mother's face and eyes. The lady of the house would later decide to move Kashan to the living room. Her four children would play on it and imagine that the lines that ran across the design were streets for their tiny cars. They would see the arches and the small circles as traffic circles where the cars could turn and passers-by could sit. They would drop crumbs of food and spill drops of tea mixed with milk and other drinks on its surface, even drops of blood sometimes, and the lady would get angry and tell them off whenever they did that. They would lie on Kashan, put cushions under their heads so that they could be close to the television when they were watching cartoons or a long film. They would grow up and get married, move to new houses and have their own children, but they would still visit the family home with their children on special occasions and holidays. Some of Kashan's colors would fade and slight wrinkles would appear on its surface, but Kashan would retain its splendor. From time to time, the lady of the house, who lived into her 70s, would remember the day she bought it. And as they sat alone together in front of the television, she would ask her husband if he too remembered. A war would come, and then another. And as usual, she would worry about her children and her grandchildren and ask them to gather in the big family home to allay her fears for them on the first night of war. Some of her grandchildren slept on the bedding she asked them to put on Kashan, and then Kashan suffocated. Not from the weight of the children sleeping on top, because they were lighter than birds, but from the rubble when the house collapsed on them and silenced them forever. Kashan imagined it could see its mother's face weeping for it and for the children. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Ocean. I'm going to read poems from my forthcoming book of poems, A Nail the Evening Hangs On. Ask the locals. Nobody knows how those so-called revolutionaries who wanted so-called year zero so bad turned into mosquitoes. I mean, mosquitoes, right? Because not butterflies or moths rolling in the mass graves. We all know the moths are children who didn't make it past five. My theory is those creeps suck the blood of their victims to forget with their bare hands 
or with other kinds of hands, the kinds with teeth. They forgot, don't forget. If you scratch your arms like that, a huge welt will appear, a rash, and those mosquitoes will keep coming. You heard it from me. Don't scratch their real names. Toothpaste over that bump won't soothe you, not this one. I'll tell you something personal. Every time I hear their real names, I itch my skin. I itch my own name too, mosquitoes. Call them mosquitoes. This kind keeps going like that mosquito straw and your calf keeps sucking. This is when I tell you, don't bend, slap. Americans dancing in the heart of darkness. It's the water festival. The city is a crowd. My skin full of sun, like so many country people who have come to Phnom Penh. The Americans hate me and I hate them, but they're the only students with me and maybe I'm American too. When I return to my windowless room at the Golden Gate Hotel, I order fresh young coconut, a club sandwich and french fries. A woman with a bruised face in a silver tray walks up seven floors, knocks on my door. The exchange students order room service too, and the same woman walks the flights of stairs nine more times. Fireworks crackle and I think, I'll be back to the same festival with my family. In the morning, 30 missed calls. There has been a human stampede on the bridge to Copec. 347 reported dead. 755 injured. Shoes litter the river. The exchange program advises us to stay away from Diamond Island. The prime minister's remarks, this is the worst thing to happen since the Khmer Rouge. The Americans agree. I grow quiet in my windowless room. I step outside for air. The city, a crowd disappearing. The crowd evacuated to the provinces. Cambodia, a perpetual stampede. School canceled at the university, a funerary ceremony instead. Do the Americans understand the program director when she tells us her neighbor's son has died? Most likely not. Later that evening, they still don't understand, but I go with them anyway, to the heart of darkness, the nightclub empty but open. We dance with Khmer boys, Strobe lights pull us on the floor, this way, that. Our feet grope the shiny black tiles reflecting the bar where old expats sit with Khmer women making money. Yeah, yeah, it isn't expensive to get here or get back. We took a tuk-tuk and we dance. They laugh. Meanwhile, my mother calls me. My father calls me. My auntie calls me from Prayang. My uncle down the street from the hotel. My uncle in Kandal. My cousin's uncle in Singriyup. Sestina. There's a sister who works so hard she never talks. A sister who screams when she hears dogs bark. A sister whose breasts have grown dry. A sister who always hides. There's a time comrades come to the hut. They can't tell who's who. How many are you? Where's the other one hiding? That sister stays close, somewhere in a hole closed off with dirt. Sometimes she sits with a sister whose baby lacked milk. In her place of hiding, she cries, thinks of comforting words, but her mouth goes dry. In a far village where works the sister who never talks, the sunset. Finally, it's her chance, time to run back. But this time, an owl screeches. She closes her eyes, she disappears, pretends she's the one who can fly. That sister's so quiet. How does that sister stay quiet? Biting her lips, she goes into hiding, between her teeth, the skin of a snake, hiding like a chasm in a field, a hole in the door to spy on the time, dark knot high up in a greasy tree, little dry well in a forgotten yard where sounds of smoke and fighting drive close. One sister soils her sarong. To wash it, the sisters search for water, but find full of air, 
a balloon which, swollen in the river, makes the youngest scream and cry, she who holds hands walking around the open eyes, her own face hiding. Then the sister who never speaks begins to speak. I want to go home, she says, but home is not close at all. No salty plum juice, no rice or fish dried. That dream is dry. And tracing with a stick, a sister who closes a circle around them in the dirt, hiding them safely inside. This is a circle, a time warp around a sister's, so we can go back to when we girls were not hiding, when fear didn't dry us up, and we could be whoever we were, dear sisters. Two more poems. The woman who was small, not because the world expanded. The elephants came out from the fields and carried me toward Chambak, toward a village doused in fires, so that in the pond fish had fried, and looking at that dead water, was a woman I had seen running home each evening with a bucket in her hand. Always her speed was the hair that flew in my face. Always her feet sounding of tanks which made dogs bark and flee, footprints deep as trenches in the grass. This is the woman who has shrunk so small when the planes came, nobody could ever find her. And since more planes, she stayed as small as a spoon, and the world seemed to enlarge, though nothing had changed. And when she saw me, she hid, threw pebbles at my ankles until I bowed down and easily picked her up, folding her inside a banana leaf. She slept. She slept well. She who is my mother, sleeping off the world again, whose person I hold in my hand when she wants to be held. ABC for Refugees. Cherubi D, how does a man who doesn't read English well know that cherubi dumb, those aren't really words, BD, but birds. Cherubi dumb, he stumbles, reading to me by the sliding glass door, cherubi D, through which I watch my brother play in the dumb dumb yard. Cherubi D, cherubi dumb, like how my father says, fine then, leave. My mother shouts, stupid, dumb. We live in a small BD nest too, one hallway to be dumb slam doors. Birds? What are birds? Thanks to my father reading with me, I have more feathers. T-H-E, first word he ever taught me to pluck. It is a word used all the time. Cherub, cherub, be dumb. The mail, the mailbox, the school bus, the, the. He asks me to read the mail. Not birds, male. If you don't read this, you will turn into birds. And I read it to him the best I can. The end, a feather, two feathers, the, the end. Mother, mother, repeat after me. Cherubi D, Cherubi Dum, we read together before bedtime. Thank you. Okay, if I move this up towards my, I'm gonna hopelessly screw up all of the sound. Everyone can hear me. Um, I need these glasses to see all of you, but not this. So I'll take them off. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you, Ocean and NYU and APA and Amita. Um, uh, it's uh, I'm I'm really thrilled to be a part of this. Um, as I was thinking about what to, uh, what to present, um, I thought I would go with two short excerpts, one from an essay of mine called The Changeling that sets up the next thing that I'll read. So this is, um,
This is online at Long Reads. I told myself stories first. In Guam at age five, I was a boy who taught himself to swim underwater before he swam across the surface. I made up my own story to explain my condition. I was a changeling child of dolphins and had been left behind with human parents, possibly to teach something to mankind by living among them. Human society, however, terrified me and I only wanted to return to the sea. I loved Guam, loved my friends, my family, yet I only wanted to inhabit the open water, its dark depths, to hurtle through the air after a deep dive, to blow air through my breathing hole as I did. I would stand at the beach as far out on the sandbar as I could go, staring at the blazing blue water, asking through telepathy for my dolphin parents to come and t get me, take me home. Don't leave me here, was the command thundering through my small head. Don't leave me here with them. The far blue surface always remained undisturbed. I don't recall how I knew about changelings, but for as long as I can remember, I knew what they were. My human father had been the one to teach me about dolphins. He was an oceanographer and took me snorkeling on his back with a mask nearly as large as my face. He showed me reefs of colored fish, anemone, and coral. After each visit, I never wanted to return to the land. I'd sit in our apartment in the kitchen at the breakfast bar, my legs kicking against the stool. When our water heater broke one morning and the apartment flooded, I was thrilled and waited out to wake my parents. <laughs> it was as if the water had come for me. <laughs> Underwater, I experienced a peace I never did on land. I began practicing a diver's trick my father taught me, which I would perfect through my childhood, emptying my lungs in order to make my body sink to the bottom and stay there, watching to see how long it took me to need air. And then, when the need came, standing against it just a moment more before propelling myself back up to the surface with a kick. The November I was six, we left Guam and moved to Maine. I was filled with a terrible sorrow as I examined the snowy streets and fields, the cold beaches, and felt the possibility of my rescue come to an end. Guam had been a paradise to me, and now I was trapped forever with my human family in a land full of snow. I told Ocean I was working on funny things, but <laughs> anyway, maybe not. Um, in Maine, I began to tell stories to others. For a very long time, I believed I was a writer because I liked questions, but I learned to like them. I had to. Once I arrived in Maine, they were my only constant companions, besides my family, all of us the subject of people's inquiries. It seemed as if I was a curiosity to almost everyone I met there. At first, the questions were directed at my mother. Whose little boy is this? And my hair was long. Whose little girl is this? This is my son, I would hear my mother say in the quiet tone I recognized as a sign of her anger. The assumption behind the question was that I couldn't be her child or I couldn't be that boy. Away from her, people were more direct. At school, for example, on the first day of the first grade, the little boy in the lunchroom took a long look at me and asked, are you a chink? I earnestly replied that I was half Korean. What's that? Someone from Korea. <laughs> What's Korea? A smaller country near China. I didn't know the meaning of the word chink and went home to ask my mother what it meant. Her horrified reaction told me much of what I needed to know. After two years of this in the third grade, I told the class I had made in Korea stamped on my buttocks. <laughs> now we're getting to the funny part. <laughs> By the fifth grade, after meeting the kinks at a New Year's Eve party in Boston that my father had taken the family to, my Korean immigrant dad was stylish, but not otherwise a known kinks fan. I joked that I was not a chink, but a kink. <laughs> As I grew older, the questions came increasingly from the parents of these kids. What are you? They would fumble and then sometimes apologize and reframe the question more tactfully. What's your background? <laughs> it, 
If they thought they were being more polite, the question was, how did your parents meet? <laughs> These were all one question with three faces, though, and the face I was shown depended on whether I was alone with someone, or in their house with their family, or on the street, whether the interaction was social, intimate, or professional. And as the story was a good one, and I knew it, I told it again and again, naively proud over everyone's responses, it took me years to realize that almost no one else is asked this question. Thinking back, I can see myself in their kitchens facing my friend's parents like some 10-year-old Scheherazade explaining away my whole life so as not to be sent home for being the wrong object. Implicit always was that my answer to these questions had to be stories, entertaining ones, and that the listener wanted endings with reassurances. I am more like you than not like you. My parents did something anyone would do. I am not threatening to you. As I got older, people began to make observations instead of asking questions. Someday everyone will look like you. They meant to offer me reassurance now. <laughs> but it gave me the feeling of being something flickering in and out of their vision, an unstable signal from the future. Having believed in Guam that I was a changeling, in Maine I was treated like one, the wrong child in the right place, not the boy they expected, like but not like the person they thought I should be, and therefore uncanny and strange. What my questioners were really after was the story of my mixed parentage, which is just to say, my parents mixing me. And when they began asking if they were still together, they had the expectation of an unhappy ending. I learned, for example, that if I said I have a white mother and a Korean father, the next response was often, that's unusual, isn't it? <laughs> this is definitely the funny part. Um, <laughs> at first, when I was more anxious to reassure, I would say yes, until I realized I was lying, as I didn't know if it was. Another question with an underlying insistence that I didn't belong, because according to their unspoken rules, my parents didn't even belong together. By the time I reached college, 18 years into answering these questions, I wanted to make t-shirts that said, I am the end of Western civilization. <laughs> I imagined wearing them and never answering another question like that again. I could just point at the shirt instead but that seemed like a big promise. <laughs> the first person to encourage me to be a writer was my first year high school English teacher who nominated me for a prize with poems I'd written in the journal I kept for class. A prize I then won. I was 14 and it shocked me so much that it took finding the prize years later to remember that I was the winner. It didn't fit my idea of myself. Two years later, I was accepted into my high school's gifted and talented program for playwriting and wrote a play inspired by a summer spent at Georgetown University's summer session where my gay roommate tried to get me to come out of the closet. I was picked as one of three plays in the state to be read in assembly by real stage actors. I was ashamed of the play two ways. I was not yet out to my mother, and so I didn't tell her about the performance. I feared what in fact happened, which is that I effectively came out to everyone in my school even in my town, just by writing about a gay man. Just not to her. But it also changed the story into one of two roommates at college, one gay, one straight, and how they deal with the differences between them. This was a lie more than a fiction. When I left for college, I found a copy of the play in the back of my mother's car as I unloaded the trunk, and I had the feeling it had snuck into the car like a finger rising up to accuse me. I had... I have other talents, and the ways I was encouraged at them made more sense to me. I even tried them out. My art and music teachers during my childhood always tried to claim me as belonging to their disciplines. I can draw well enough that my drawings are praised, and I do so for my own pleasure. In college, I even tried to be an art major for one year. I can sight read music either as a singer or playing the clarinet. I have a talent for listening also, and it seems related to another mystery of my existence, which is the frequency with which people tell me their secrets. Whether I've known them for decades or a minute, 
It is as if they have waited their whole life for the chance encounter in which they confess to me. If my narrators feel as if they are telling you something they've never told anyone before, it is in part because I have sat through what you might call thousands of rehearsals. I never knew why so many people told me to be a writer. I still don't. Maybe it was because I was always telling stories in answer to people's questions. At first it seemed something apart from me, apart from what I wanted for myself. My own writing seemed ordinary, or in the case of my poetry, it either seemed to me unintelligible to others or too easily understood, making me feel exposed. I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow. Um, my name is Mahogany L. Brown, and uh, thank you for putting this moment together uh, where we get to celebrate one of the most important persons in my writing life and life life, Ocean Wong. Um, and because I met Ocean, uh, geez, I'm old, I forgot. When did, <laughs> it was Poets House? Yes, Poets House Emerging Fellowship. And I came in with all my Oakland girl poems and I felt very out of place. It was like, you have to talk a little more academic, yeah. <laughs> and Ocean was like, absolutely not. <laughs> and, and that was it, I, I fell in love. And so I'm gonna open with the poem. Um, especially because uh, we all survived middle school, so shout out to you. <laughs> <laughs> this shit was real. Was horrible, horrible times. And we made it through. This is our support group meeting, so word up. <laughs> so my 14-year-old self speaks uh, from Oakland, California. Me and Lily ain't talking. Because she thinks she cute. Cause she think I ain't. Must be pretty boy Curtis, all in her head, all in her mouth, making her forget her home training, making her forget her daddy got a gun for a living. And her mama ain't live with them, and this is why I ain't think she ain't got no sense, no how, cause ain't nobody but fast girls checking for Curtis, and he keep her name close, and she don't come home the same way no more. She must think she cute. Must think I ain't. How she keep me waiting like I'm supposed to like Curtis or something. And I hate his light skinned itself. Especially because he ain't funny as he think. Especially when he calls me black. And ugly. And stupid. And she stay grinning. Like he the son. Like we ain't friends. Like I am protected from them heifers and want to jump on her every time we go to the skate rink. Because Lily pretty and their boyfriends forget they home training around her. So when Curtis say the things I've already said about myself, and she laugh, I know deep down inside, she ain't never really thought I was pretty know how. How she just said them lies to keep my shadow all up and around her sunshine smile, she be the sun. When we go to the pool party and everybody there in their bikinis and I got my one piece on with a white t-shirt on top. And the boys, they just looking like their mama ain't taught them nothing worth knowing. And Lily got that good hair, so she don't care if it's wet and loose. And my hair ain't close to being good. So I keep it in a tight, 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 real tight ponytail. Till the sun gets so hot, I jump in to cool my sadness down. It's like I already know, so I let my, so I let my shoulders sink low like my heart be. And I watch Lily how she walk and everybody stop. And I'm trying to learn, cause ain't nobody got time for the kind of shade I got. But everybody got time for the sun. Lily smile at Curtis. Now, he only a little bit cute. <laughs> but he ain't funny or smart, so that's how I know she lying. <laughs> and I pretend I don't hear his South Sacramento slur. 
I pretend I can't see his hazel eyes when he say, lose her, ugly, black ass, and Lily laugh. She say, shut up, Curtis. But it sounds like, come here. So I dunk my head underwater slow and wait for her to say anything like, I don't care how pretty your eyes is, don't talk about my friend, but she just say, shut up. And she laughs. And I think I could stay here where it's all blurry aqua blue. I think I could stay here where my eyes don't hurt so much and it don't feel like I've been looking at the sun all day long. Thank you. Um, So for the last year, I've been working on a piece about mass incarceration and the impact on women and children. And it's a book of essays. But for the the work, the the things that I can't fit into the essay, I've been writing this long form poem. I'm just going to share a small excerpt of that poem. It's called Nation Induced Disorder. It is easy to singularly define people by the worst thing that they have ever done but it becomes more difficult to imagine what we would want the world to do if it were us. Clint Smith. One, if my mother were ever convicted for her addiction, like my father, I wonder who I would be robbing now. The data from the Fragile Family Studies say my kind of survival displays more behavioral problems and early juvenile delinquencies. I say, you right. I rode into the night with a pistol in my gray hoodie spitting image of my father, his nickname akin to Boom, his red skin the only thing I remember him towering over me. Black hair, red bloodshot eyes, already running, already gone. This was the closest time I ever came to becoming a with a number for a name. It's easier than you think to lose yourself in search of country. Politicians with expensive silk ties cut taxes, cue the reality TV series, suggest art programs to settle the inmates, then wonder why humans climb the walls, trying to escape their own skin after the teaching artist is asked to stop bringing in poems that encourage collective behavior. Two, marathon runs of Wentworth miss the room like smoke clouds, and I know TV is only TV to someone that had never been forced to look outside their own heartbreak before. What's a cliff dive to a black man hustled by his own country? He earns 92 cents an hour and my tuition still ain't free. The woman behind the financial aid counter ask me what my father makes. I say, furniture for the dorms here. I say, grandfatherless children. I say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who he is. Three, and no one prays for their babies. Four, I enter the gates of a boy's prison, menacing the border of Bristol, England, and wonder if the smell that refuses to leave my jean jacket three days later resembles the air of Pelican Bay. I toss the jacket in the trash, privileged with the ability to push away the dilemma of a nation-induced disorder. This must be the scent of apathy. Still, this is the closest I'll ever come to visiting my father. Five. I remember death by its proximity to what I love the most. Six, yesterday, Nipsey Hussle was mowed down in front of his clothing store on Slauson and Crenshaw. The world raged on, a forest of dying, and I know this is how we grieve. Candles and teddy bears and flowers and posters, tears and prayer hands and wailing and wailing, fighting and swinging and singing and singing for the flawed men that find redemption for the men that remind us of home. Seven, and just minutes away in Inglewood, California, my uncle pulled his blue plastic folding chair under the nearest shaded tree in the yard. My uncle's youngest brother has been dead for years. He sits outside anyway. I wonder if he still smells the seized candy factory two blocks away. If he remembers how sweet and satisfying it tasted after we pulled our change together for lollipops. I wonder if he still waits for my gone uncle to visit him, if that's what he's risking under the sun. Seven, 
I remember death. Eight. When I learned my favorite cousin Andrew was murdered, a shotgun blast to the dome, I am in Sacramento preparing for my Little League softball finals. I play my positions, catcher or third base. I want to be pitcher. I want to deliver the strikeouts, but the daughter of the coach is much more consistent than I am. So I play my positions. I guard where I'm told. I never tag anyone out. We don't win the season. I decide I love the game even if I never win. I decide I love the game even if it never loves me back. Nine, I remember. Ten, when I return home, my mother is nowhere to be seen, but her smell is everywhere. I don't burden her with the bad news. Her child didn't win, but when I hear a gasp somewhere behind her closed door, I figure she knows what I know. I don't think twice of the phone's plastic echo as it returns to its cradle in haste. Andrew, a teenager with a brilliant smile. Andrew, just out of jail. Andrew, my favorite cousin could make a room erupt into a confetti of joy. Andrew, a gunshot wound to the head. Andrew, bloody and dying in front of my cousin who screamed and cried and cradled his face in one hand, her other hand holding close her newborn son. When I hear her name at our family barbecue years later, after she's testified against the killers and lost her spirit to dance with friends, I make her a new world. I decide she must look like she's never held a dead boy before. Her mushroom hairstyle is asymmetric and perfect. Her eyes shine. Maybe, yeah, maybe, she still smiles and drinks her sweet Pepsi. And my last piece, I want to invite a guest, um, a flautist, that she plays the flute. Please welcome Elena Penderhughes to the stage. And I also want to preface this moment, actually, because I would never have done this had I not met the person we are here celebrating today. This poem is all about meditation and being still and calm. And I didn't know what that was, Ocean. I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, and what's funny is because we were in this um, Poets House Emerging Fellowship experience together, we remember that uh, workshop where we had to write a poem for each other? So this was the first time I ever wrote a poem for someone I did not realize I loved yet. And because of that, I made you a little something to take, a little... A little black girl magic fan, you know what I mean? Just a little palm leaf, a little some some. Give it up for Ocean. You can go ahead and stand up for this beautiful person. And so for you. Yes, right? You see how perfect? It was built for you. And so with that, um, I want you to uh, consider how you prepare yourself to leave your house for the day. I didn't realize how much armor I put on until I started doing my head wrap and like meditating. I was like, oh, I'm like getting ready for war. <laughs> and then I realized we all have a way of preparing ourselves to leave the sanctuary of our home, right? So get into the mind frame of that. Close your eyes. Okay, I know it's New York. Hold your purse, but close your eyes. <laughs> Because y'all really was like, mm. glad you met Hayden, but mm. give it a shot. And just think of the moment, maybe you're like, you know, moisturizing and conditioning your facial features, your hands, head wrap, a nice little wing with your eyeliner, whatever it is. Be there in this moment and uh, let us guide you. Today you choose. Today is yours. Today is only today. Tomorrow ain't here yet. Slow down. Slow down. Breathe softly. Breathe for the homies that ain't here. Breathe 
for the homies that is. Breathe for your own good skin, your skin, your smile, your you, you. Come back, come back, come back to yourself. Tie the knot, tie the bow. Fingers fold over and over a song. Praise this gift. Today you will. Today you choose. Today is yours. Today is only today. Tomorrow ain't here yet. Slow down. Slow down. Breathe slowly. Breathe softly. Breathe for the homies that ain't here. Breathe for the homies that is. Breathe for your own good skin, your skin, your smile, your you, you. Come back, come back, come back to yourself. Look at your cheekbones. Look at the loft of your eyebrows. Look at this magical shimmer, you so worthy, you so heavy in your weight of yes, you so fly, you wet the water, you cool the brow, you heat the skillet, you the sustenance and the sunset, you keep them chasing the sparks you leave. Today you will, today you choose, today is yours, today is only today. Tomorrow ain't here yet. Slow down. Slow down. Breathe softly, slowly. Breathe for the homies that ain't here. Breathe for the kin that is. Breathe for your own good skin, your skin. Smile, you, you, you. Come back, come back. Come back to yourself. Miraculous stargaze, most fortunate sky beam. Beyond brilliant, be your resilience, but you knew that already. Who told you any different? You tell them, today you will. And today you choose. And today is yours. Yes, today is only today because tomorrow ain't here yet. Slow down. Slow down, breathe softly, breathe for the homies that ain't here, breathe for the kin that is, breathe for your own good skin, your skin, your smile, your tribe, your you, 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 come back, come back, come back to yourself, galaxy of woman, Wonder of human, but you knew that already. Who told you any different? Anything that don't heighten your stride, leave it today. Anything that don't strengthen your heart, leave it today. Anything that don't propel your wingspan forward, leave it today. Whoever told you you wasn't fly, whoever told you you wasn't strong, whoever told you you wasn't brilliant, whoever told you you wasn't beautiful is a lie. Ashe. Oh, Y'all hear me? I can't hear myself. <laughs> oh, it feels so good when there's good art. Um, Thank you so much, everyone, um, all four of you, for, for filling the space um, with your voice and your art. We'll talk a little bit, and then um, we'll just keep uh, these words in us through the night and through the weeks. This year's theme at APA is the aftermath of war. And there are many definitions of war, private, domestic, geopolitical. 
and there are many definitions of aftermaths. One of the things that is often charged with folks who come out of aftermath is how do you come to terms? How do you come to terms with being a refugee? How do you come to terms with being a survivor? How do you come to terms with living with sexual assault? How do you come to terms being black in America? And that question is coming out of this disingenuous ignorance. How can you expect anyone to answer that question when the systems that made that suffering perennial never checked themselves to begin with? The ones who created the violence, who fashioned the bombs, made the weapons, never asked himself, how do we come to terms with this? But it is up to the writer all of a sudden, the thinker out of that, to deliver an answer. So we're not going to answer that. What I'm interested in is not why writing through aftermaths is important. We know that these writers have been doing this their whole lives, and y'all are here already knowing that. We would not disrespect your reading and your intelligence by entertaining that question. What I'm interested in is how do we, as writers here, innovate through aftermaths and harness the ambition to create art. In other words, I'm interested in the how. To go back to the root of the word poet is a creator. How do we create? How do we find the tools necessary to ask these questions? And how do we articulate ambition in order to build an architecture of which to think and inquire within? Because the ones who create the weaponry, who fashion the bombs, are never asked to be humble. But it's often the writer of color who's asked to be grateful, to be humble. In other words, we should start bowing just because we've entered the room, even before we've done our work. But the ones who make the weapons rarely say, maybe we should be humble and not have the assault rifle fired that fast. Maybe we should be humble and not have the epicenter of the bomb reach this large a swath. They've never asked that. The ones that fashion destruction never ask themselves, just take a step back and have a seat. But because we live in the system of a capitalistic military industrial complex, built this very country, built on the genocide of Native Americans and fashioned through slavery. Because we are in that system, often it is the artists, as soon as they enter the room, to say, be grateful. And also, how do you deal with it? So today, and throughout the spirit of this year and my time here, I'm not interested in, how, in offering an answer of how we deal with it, because maybe we do not. Maybe the most powerful answer is no. Maybe I'll let you know. Maybe not in this lifetime. Maybe not in the next. The more pressing question, the more question that I'm interested in is how do we fashion a way forward using what is under our agency, in this case, language? How do we take the English language, a language that has destroyed swaths of peoples and continents, many lives lost through its indoctrination, and how do we take and use such a tool to reclaim those very peoples the system sought to eliminate. That in itself 
is an innovative question. That in itself is a technology. And I'm interested in allowing us as writers of color to be as ambitious as those who create the systems and technologies that seek to erase us. I'll, I'll start with you, Mahogany. Um, someone, <laughs> <laughs> you've always, you've incredibly inspiring to me because I think you're one of the artists who never sought to fall into a place in the literary map. You never said, I'm gonna be this poet, I'm gonna be that poet. You're a publisher, you're a children's book writer, you're a poet, an essayist, a thinker, an activist, a community builder. In other words, you've never asked, what should I be? But rather, what can I do with my art and my body? And I think ultimately, you're using the larger systems of hope to create whatever that is available to you. And I'm interested in, in your approach, in a multidisciplinary approach, as you write through various aftermaths, according uh, to how you see it. Um, thank you. And yeah, uh, the, I think the how is, is really in the everyday, daily showing up for yourself. Um, I have a daughter, so showing up for my daughter. And I recognize that, um, and I said this to someone, I was like, I, I, got, I was pregnant at 21, and so I realized that she became my purpose before that, it was just like, you know, a notorious B.I.G. song. It was all parties and bullshit. It was like, hey, just Cisco and 40s and what, because I didn't think I had long to live. So have fun while you're here. And then I had this daughter who I realized that if this is legacy, if this is what it looks like, if I have an entire universe looking back at me, what is the blueprint that I will leave for her to survive? And so the how continues to be for me uh, something that started out as an echo chamber and, and now is resonating as, as this, like, here is a blueprint. Okay, if you can't dance, sing. If you can't sing, draw. If you can't draw, open the door. If you can't open the door, you know, like, whatever it takes for you to be a part of the change, do that. There is no small job. And, and my continuous return to the page is always thinking of um, who wasn't allowed to write, who wasn't allowed to tell their story. Um, I came into poetry at, at a very funny time because it wasn't, you know, it was after we, we were allowed to write, obviously, and read. But, but what was happening to me was um, I was told poetry doesn't sound like that. You're not supposed to speak like that. You're not supposed to write like that. So validating my voice, I knew that that taught everyone if I can enter a room, in any room that I enter, I belong there, then that goes for everyone. And that, that was the first and foremost for me. Beautiful, thank you so much. Uh, Alex, um, you know, as someone, um, as both of us who written autobiographical novels, um, you haven't read, written The Beautiful Edinburgh, who's, which was so uh, seminal um, and informative to me. Uh, a book about abuse of various kinds of survival. And it's ultimately, what's beautiful about that book to me was that it's not only a, a Bildungsroman, you know, often in the American tradition, the Bildungsroman is very anxious about looking back, right? We, if we think of Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, even the Bell Jar, Sylvia Plath, it's, it's a small temporal window in which one is released from childhood through college or through uh, coming of age or what have you. But what was interesting about your book was that it was interested in a prehistory. It recast the Bildungsroman in the American landscape as a model where one has to know one's elders before one knows oneself. And to me, it was a praxis, not only of something that's familiar to me as an Asian American, but a responsible and dignified way of looking at one's space and what space one takes up in the American literary landscape and the familial landscape. And then after that, you wrote this relatively ecstatic and celebratory book on, on centralized around opera and music and art in Europe. 
and what, the way I see it on a macro level is someone riding through aftermaths of trauma and sexual abuse and towards literally singing in the, in the second book. And I'm curious of, of that incredible trajectory and very singular one. And I, I would be curious of how you, you approach um, you know, your career so far writing those two books. I think, well, first of all, thank you for that beautiful vision of my work that I didn't have before. Um, <laughs> I know. I was like, wow. Um, I should say, uh, the very first time that I, that I met Ocean, I was going there to interview him, and I thought we were going to talk about him, and he wanted to talk about me. And I feel like this is a little bit like that, but, um, which I love about him. I love, uh, I love how much you see when you read. It's, uh, it's incredible. Um, yeah, I think the, so the, the first part is, uh, it's a fascinating description of it to me because I really had not thought of it that way at all, but I think uh, I was trying to see, yeah, I suppose, see myself in history with that first novel. And also after, you know, as I describe in that essay, all that time of answering those questions, I think I was writing something and I wanted to anchor it so firmly that people would just shut up. <laughs> with the question in terms of the like, do you belong here? Why are you here? What's going on? And, uh, um, and so in some way it was an aesthetics born out of that frustration, a kind of uh, a, uh, an impulse to, to use that art form and make something that insisted on me within a context. Um, even if that's not what the novel is about, that is what the novel does. Um, the, and, and moving towards the I mean, I remember uh, actually at that first conversation we had, uh, the, the novel had not quite come out yet, I think. It was 2015. And, um, you know, when you... The thing about writing a book is that you really have to prepare for no one to care. <laughs> because it really is a whole game of like, well, who asked you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think, you know, the one way that I had dealt with my experiences uh, as, a, as a kid and as a young man was to, uh, was to have this idea of myself as uncanny and to own it and to say, like, yes, I am uncanny. Uh, I am a strange witch child. Um, what of it, uh, you know, and um, and so in some ways, the Queen of the Night is a song about that, in a way, like uh, and a way of taking that feeling and turning it into an epic, you know, uh, to and also it was a way of thinking about uh, a life spent changing shape, sometimes on purpose. Sometimes not, and that's probably the most autobiographical thing about that novel. Um, and the the thing that surprised me about it was how much war I found in opera. How much, uh, whether it was covert, such as like, you know, uh, Verdi being forced to change the setting of uh, Unbalo and Mascara from you know, someplace in Europe to, to Revolutionary War era Boston, where they definitely did not have mass balls at the time, um, to, uh, to the, the siege of Paris, where they used a, a machine gun on a civilian population for the first time, um, or a prototype of it. Um, so those were... Those were fascinating discoveries, I guess, the, along the way. And I, I suppose as I 
as I move forward now, the thing that I'm actually trying to lay down is that sense of the uncanny, or as my husband put it, no more curses. Um, <laughs> and to take up the sublime of the ordinary. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Monica, um, you know, writing out of a diaspora that has so few, you know, and I think particularly Southeast Asian identity, someone shared Southeast Asian roots, you know, one of the great challenges of writing as Southeast Asians in America is Asian American as a moniker becomes so monolithic. But the reality is that Southeast Asians have the highest high school dropout rates. And we are the first generation that's coming out of a rupture and trauma. Right. And so much of our elders, you know, we highest uh, mental health uh, issues, lowest rates of English, uh, lowest income amongst um, Asian Americans by a large swath. And so we are really writing the beginning um, Southeast Asians are writing the very beginning of the diaspora and the literature that we're making here is starting to be the literature that lays the ground. And it is a grand moment. It's a terrifying moment. But I also see it myself, and I'm curious how you see it, as a privilege. I don't see it as a burden. It's a privilege to be able to look at us closely and under the power of language and writing render ourselves the way we see fit because for so long it is others who've written about us and written over us. And I'm curious, you know, as a, a Khmer writer uh, coming out with a book very soon, a beautiful book, you know, how, how do you navigate your position uh, in this beautiful beginning of a, of a great legacy? Thank you, Ocean. Um, I just want to say, yeah, I, that's a really big question. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, you know, Ocean, you were the person who taught me that a community could just mean two people. And um, I always carried that with me. When you told that to me, you said, you only need two people to make a community. So thank you for that. Um, I think that growing up like in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, as a daughter of refugees, um, I was very isolated. So I didn't see myself reflected in literature. Um, if we got to the Vietnam War in US history, Cambodia was maybe a sentence or two, or maybe like a little paragraph. Um, so I feel really honored to be able to write um, poetry around the Cambodian-American narrative. I think that it was here in New York City when I first discovered this poet named Yu Sum Ol. And he's a Khmer poet who actually went to Iowa's writer's workshop and graduated in 1968. And then he went back to Cambodia and that was when the Khmer Rouge you know, had taken over. And he had to burn his manuscript and he memorized his poems during the genocide. And I think about that. Sometimes I don't know if I'm one of the first writers um, to lay this groundwork for diasporic literature um, because he was here. And I think about those who were writing before me and those who were writing when Cambodian refugees first came to this country in like the 80s, um, and how the white publishing industry was not ready for their stories. So I'm aware of all this trauma gazing. I'm aware of the way that Americans love trauma, love violence, love to ask about um, my parents' traumas. And um, I think that, you know, I consider myself second generation Cambodian American. So to carry, to carry these histories that I've inherited, these traumas too, 
um, I, I want to be very careful about um, not perpetuating that violence. And I want to be careful to not gaze at my parents' traumas in the way that history books have done that, um, the ways that maybe white scholars definitely have done that. Um, so I think about tenderness a lot. I think about desire and how that is an act of defiance too. I think about joy. It's hard to write about joy. I think about reclamation and resilience and trying to understand what that means, um, what it means to honor those who came before me, my ancestors, those who may have never dreamed of me being here on this stage. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot to navigate when it comes to um, just creating a narrative that is fuller and that is just how do we come at how do we come at our stories from many different angles so that we can create a fuller a story? Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, going into uh, Sanan's question by reading one of um, my favorite poems from Sanan titled, When I Was Torn by War. Baghdad, 1990. I took a brush, immersed in death, and drew a window on war's wall. I opened it, searching for something. But I saw another war, and a mother weaving a shroud for the dead man still in her womb. The incredible power of that poem, it almost feels like a future poem that has never left us. A future poem that is actually the ghost of poems that came before it in the sense that it rejects all the things we ask in the Western narrative structures of poems as modes of transcendence, that the poem should begin with war and perhaps move beyond it. Right? What does war do for a, a character or a speaker? What do they gain from it? And this poem, even because of its size, is an absolute refusal to move beyond war. And the, 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 from the title, when I was torn by war, is almost a, a testimony, but a thesis. And as we continue, we realize that death goes into the place where life is supposed to come out of. And in a way, it becomes the very cyclical nightmare that we are asked to revisit as readers. And the poem becomes a technology of reckoning an absolute refusal of transcendence. And I think that's one of the, the great moments in a poem like that, is that it does not allow us to move on. The language of, of, of grief and the language of healing or time is often, how do you move on? That's one question of how do you come to terms? How have you moved on? And this poem, in a way, says no. And that's one of the most powerful moments because it says no to the rest of the world in order to say yes to itself. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> you read my poem so beautifully and spoke about it so eloquently. I, I feel I don't need to say much. I, I think <laughs> I'll try. Uh, I mean, it, it shows uh, that, I'm, <laughs> that I'm old, but I should say that in the initial context, because I unfortunately grew up in, in Iraq during the Iraq-Iran war, which lasted for 80 years. And that was a very bloody, until then it was the longest war after World War II. And now, but now of course the Afghanistan war, which most of our citizenry seems to kind of be almost unaware of. So uh, the war ended in 88, uh, and there was big joy in, in Baghdad because we thought, most of us, that it has to be about a decade before we get into another war, but 
1990 with Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and then the U.S. embarking on So this, this sense of no respite from war, but um, I mean, what, what you pointed out is very important, I think, whether in Iraq or in this country or elsewhere, because closure, whether in narrative structures or in politics, is always deployed to silence the voice of the victims. And that wars don't really end. They end for the victors. And I'm speaking of all types of wars. The wars that, that go on on the streets of this country, if you happen to be a person of a certain color. And so, I mean, in, and I, I, in the writers that I really love, including Toni Morrison and others, you see that how, you know, linear narratives have, a certain, have certain consequences politically and philosophically. And... It's a lot of folks theoretically say I want to, you know, so disrupt that linear narrative. But it's very important for me because, especially in this country, but elsewhere, um, the way we talk about the past is very consequential as to how we talk about the present. Because there is no past actually; uh, it's all in the present. And as you said, in a way, I mean, of course, intuitively. Uh, later I look at that poem, but it continues in my work uh, in not wanting to transcend because, and as we've all said, we're all very privileged, and I, I learned resilience from the millions and millions of people around the world who fight these little wars every day and go on without the rewards that we get um, to celebrate. The interesting thing about this linearity is that even when the, in the publishing industry in this country, I mean, I, I write in Arabic, uh, I translate a few of my novels, but I write in Arabic, so my immediate audience is not in this country, it's in the Arab world. But in, interestingly enough, in a lot of conversations with publishers and editors, uh, in presenting the ideas, they want closure, they want an arc, they want some kind of reward at the end, and they want us to play the role of the grateful immigrant. And so stories that disrupt this simplistic narrative about the global south are not marketable because, you know, I have to play the grateful immigrant or I have to play or, perf you know, perform the role of the happy Iraqi who fled dictatorship to come and flourish in the U.S. and so on and so forth. But thank you for, for, for reading that poem because... Yeah, I mean, we need, we need to remember, sounds like a cliche, but the collective responsibility of the wars that are waged in our name and with our tax dollars as we speak now, sadly, there's probably a drone killing a civilian in Pakistan or in Yemen uh, because from the satellite, from the gaze of the experts who are not experts, sitting in Arizona or elsewhere, it just looks like a turbaned dark man going somewhere is, is a terrorist. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Anita is telling me to wrap up. and um, We can talk forever, I'm sure. And thank you to these poets for their work and for offering um, what ambition and innovation means to them. Um, I, I would just like to make a final comment. Um, as an artist in residence in the APA space. And to me, it feels important to say a little bit about what it means to be an Asian American artist here, particularly widely an artist of color. Um, and, and I see, you know, from glancing that there are many Asian American artists and many Asian Americans, period, here. Um, and I just want to say that if you are going to be an Asian American artist, be prepared to be unfathomable to the rest of the world and the rest of the country. When it comes to Asian American innovation and agency, we are often legible when we are at service to larger structures and art, often Eurocentric ones. The great sociologist Summer Kim Lee calls this Asian American experience the after you embodiment, where Asian Americans are often asked to be the accommodators of larger forces in this country. We hold the doors, we, do, we nurse, 
We put our heads down, we wash the feet, we do the nails, we press the clothes, we iron it, we accommodate. And I think because of this, when it comes to Asian American talent, it is only legible when it is seen in service of Bach as prodigies or Beethovens. You, you, you can play the piano well as an instrument, a talented, finely tuned instrument of Western art, but when it comes to your own thinking, your own creation, you will not be legible. You'll be inconceivable. It is either innate, genetic, as it is when it comes to mathematics or science. Right? It's in their genes. Right? Or it comes through the inhumane disciplinarian parents, tiger moms and tiger dads, where the larger structures, the larger white parents can say, I would never put my son through that. So I will willingly forego talent and genius in order to preserve my humanity and compassion and ethical parenting, thereby stripping the agency and the talent of the Asian American instrument. So when you dare to be a writer, a songwriter, a dramatist, an essayist, in other words, as an Asian American, when you dare to have your own agency, your own dreams, when you no longer become the instrument, the empty vessel of larger pre-made art, you will be called pretentious. You will be called unrestrained. It will not be ready for your mind when it creates its own thing. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You should do it, but be prepared. Expect it. And even more so, why not? Why not be as ambitious as you want to be? Why not be pretentious? What is pretentious but to have the pretense to the assumption that you belong here? Be prepared to be inconceivable and then be prepared to innovate beyond that because we need you and we are ready for you. Thank you.